Hello, this is Matt Crump, and I'm back with another learning module for Psych 2530, Introduction to Cognitive Psychology. And this time, we're going to skim through a classic paper on mental imagery, which is the topic of this learning module. Let's head over to the paper. Here it is. It's called Visual Imagery Differences in the Recall of Pictures. It's by David Marks, and it was published in 1973 in the British Journal of Psychology. We've come across this paper in the textbook. It's one of the papers that developed a questionnaire to measure how vivid people say their mental imagery is. And this paper goes a step further uh, to determine whether people say they have really good visual imagery, also have good memory for pictures they've seen before, compared to people who say they have poor visual imagery. Now, um, here's the plan for taking a look at this paper. We're going to go through the pieces one by one, talk about the introduction, talk about the experiments, there's three of them, and we're going to take a look in detail about some of the methods and some of the results. And before we do that, I'm going to give you just a quick snapshot idea of what the question and basic finding of this paper is. As we've been learning from the textbook, when you ask people about their mental imagery abilities, their ability to see things, hear things with their mind's eye, you get a big range of answers. That's what I've illustrated on this dimension here. Some people will say they've got really good, super vivid mental imagery, and other people will say they have really poor, almost no visual imagery. And people say all sorts of stuff in between. This paper from 1973 comes up with a questionnaire to measure where you are on this dimension. It presents the questionnaire to large groups of people, and it finds the people who say they have really good uh, visual imagery, and the people who say they have really poor visual imagery. It kind of ignores the people in the middle and gives uh, the poor groups and the good groups, memory tests for pictures. These pictures have lots of things in them. And the question is, who will do better on the memory test for pictures? Do your claims about your mental imagery ability predict anything about how well you can remember the details of pictures? Let's jump back into the paper. And if we read the abstract, we would see... Uh, all of what I just said is pretty much right there. So the abstract's gonna tell us that subjects who differed in their verbal reports of visual image vividness, those are the people who said they were good or very poor, they were tested in recall experiments for colored photographs. So what did they find? Who was better? In three experiments, subjects who reported vivid visual imagery were more accurate than subjects who reported poor visual imagery. So apparently, whether or not you have uh, vivid or non-vivid mental imagery actually will tell, it will influence your ability to remember details from these photographs. Let's jump into the paper to see uh, what procedures and experiments were used to generate evidence for these claims. So we're going to back up and we're going to look at the introduction. It's pretty short. It's only a page and a half long. There it is, the whole introduction. The introduction in this paper serves two major purposes. One, it sets up the question that's being asked. Here is a good place you can see that. Uh, the author says, can individual differences in verbal reports of imagery vividness be used as predictors of performance in memory tasks? Next, the author summarizes some prior research, points out that there is, you know, sort of uh, not mixed evidence. There's mixed evidence uh, that visual imagery ability predicts memory performance. Prior researchers have looked at it a little bit, they didn't find clear-cut results. And by the end of the introduction, 
the author is telling us very specifically what's going to happen here. They wanted to improve on aspects of prior research. In the current studies, basically what happens is participants were designated as good or poor visualizers based on a new questionnaire called the Vividness of Visual Imagery Questionnaire. After their uh, abilities were qu uh, quantified based on that questionnaire, participants were shown colored photographs and then they had to do a memory test for the contents and details of those photographs. So let's go into experiment one and see what happened. So 74 people in an introductory psych class completed the VVIQ. We can read about it in a little detail here. It's 16 questions. And if we go to the end of the manuscript, I'll just quickly scroll down here. We can see a printout of the questionnaire. And right now I'll just briefly take you through what would happen here. There is four different scenarios and each scenario has four questions. The first scenario is think of a relative or friend, bring a relative or friend to your mind's eye and carefully uh, consider the picture that comes into your mental image. So if you were doing that right now, like for me, I'm thinking about a friend of mine, trying to image them in my mind's eye. Okay, I'm trying, it's kind of difficult while I'm also lecturing, but that's okay. Now imagine a researcher asks you the first question in the questionnaire. Here's, here's the question, the exact contour of face, head, shoulders, and body. It doesn't exactly sound like a question, but that's okay. What you're supposed to do is consider those features of the mental image, and then give a rating of one to five. Let's go check out the rating scale. Here's the rating scale. It appeared earlier on in the paper on page 18. So if you're considering how well you can uh, think about those details of your friend, you're gonna give an answer from one to five. A one means perfectly clear and vivid as normal vision. A two is clear and reasonably vivid. A three is moderately clear and vivid. Four is vague and dim. And five is no image at all. You only know that you're thinking of the object. Okay, so we're back to this imagery task. The researcher would continue to ask these different items. So if you're considering your friend in your mind's eye, they might say, what are the characteristic poses of head, attitudes of body, etc." So I'm supposed to think about if I, how vividly I can imagine that and give it a one to five answer. And I'm then asked to imagine the precise carriage length of step, etc., in walking or the different colors worn in familiar clothes and give a one to five answer for each of those four different questions. Once we're done with that, we'll move on to the next scenario. So this is a visualize a rising sun scenario in your mind. And then the researcher would ask, uh, give a rating from one to five, you know, tell me how vivid uh, the sun is rising above the horizon into a hazy sky. So you have to imagine that part and give a rating one, super vivid, or five, nothing at all. That's basically the questionnaire. Now we can jump into a little schematic of this. Here I've uh, got 16 rows, one for each of the four questions you'd be asked for each of the scenarios. So the first four are for the thinking of a friend scenario, then the next four are for a rising sun scenario. These are some of the answers you might have given. If you were someone who has very good visual imagery, you might be given ones and twos for all of your answers because you can have very vivid imagery of these things. If you took an average of everything, then you might get a number that's close to one if most of your answers were close to one. And you would be considered a good visualizer according to this paper. Other people might have uh, numbers closer to five or four indicating they don't experience very vivid mental imagery and the average of their answers across all 16 might be closer to a four or a five. So we're still in experiment one. We're heading back to the paper and we're going to see what happens next. And here it, oh, 
Oh, I missed it. Here it is. All right. So remember, 74 people did the questionnaire. Then on the basis of the scores, whether they got close to one or close to five, uh, we get these two different groups of people. So the author took the 18 lowest scores closest to one and called those people the good visualizers, and then the 18 highest scores closest to five and called those people the poor visualizers. Placed them into two groups and then gave them a memory test. So this here is a basic schematic of what happened. 18 people in each group and everyone takes a memory test for pictures. Let's take a look at this memory test for pictures. How, uh, what was involved with it? So there was 15 colored photographs. We don't get to see what they all looked like. There are seven of the photographs were sets of unrelated objects in a random arrangement and the rest of them were sort of natural scenes like a New York City seat screen, street scene or a marketplace or some, uh, I guess, a Turkish pavement scene and so on. They give one example of a picture with a bunch of stuff in it. And you'd look at this and then be tested for your memory for details. So how exactly did the memory test go? That's described in the procedure section. And it's pretty straightforward. Let's run through this pretty quickly so you can get a feeling of what it would be like to be a participant in this experiment. So each trial involves three stages. This would be one trial per picture. Remember, there's 15 pictures. We start with stimulus presentation. So you're going to see a picture on the screen for 20 seconds, and you get to look at everything uh, on the picture. I mean, we could do that. Maybe let's look at this picture for, pretend we're going to do it for 20 seconds. So I'm looking around, and I'm like, I see that stuff. And, okay, I'm trying to, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm looking at this thing really hard. <laughs> and uh, try to remember all the stuff on it and count to 20. And then it would get taken away from you. And there's a 40 second delay period. So the picture has gone now. How about this? Um, I'm going to move it off to a blank screen. So this is the 40 second delay interval. What are you doing now? Well, what they do for you is ask you to perform subtraction task. So you start at a high number like 700 and you have to subtract by three. So 700 minus three is 697. 697 minus three is 694. 691. 598. Whoop, did I get it right? Um, anyways, you are <laughs> going down by three and you have to do that for 40 seconds. This prevents um, using your words in your inner voice to maybe uh, talk about to yourself what you saw in the picture. Instead, you're tying up those cognitive processes with a number subtraction task. So after the 40 seconds is gone, the researcher is going to ask participants individual questions about what was in the picture. So here's some examples. Importantly, there was five questions per picture. Here's some examples. Question number one, and they were always a question with multiple choice. So what number was written on the golf ball? Four, five, or six? Do you remember? Um, we could go back up and check. Okay, there's a four there, so that, that would have been the correct answer. What was in the bottom right-hand corner, clock, scissors, or siphon? So you have to remember that it was this siphon thing, and so on. So there's these five questions. Once you do all of that for one picture, then the next picture is shown, and there's another delay and another round of questions. All right, so what happened in this experiment? That gets to the results section. We've got uh, results that are written down right here, but they're also displayed in this table. These are the mean number of correct answers per trial 
for good and poor visualizers. Um, the author broke this down by sex, but we're just going to look at the column at the end here, the overall performance. And here we have good visualizers. They got, on average, 3.17 correct out of 5. Remember, there's those five questions. So how many? if you got them all right, you get 5 out of 5. 3.17. That's more than half right. Not perfect. How about the poor visualizers? Did they do better or worse? They got 2.85 correct out of 5. So this isn't a very big difference. Uh, it's a difference of, what, 0.17 and then a 15. So we're thinking, what's that, like a 32, a 0.32 difference? 0.32 of a, of a multiple choice question is essentially the difference here. So that is our first round of evidence that uh, good visualizers have better memory for picture details than poor visualizers. Based on this evidence, I wouldn't say that the difference is huge. I mean, both of these numbers are kind of close to three, and it's not like the people who had who said they had good visualization abilities are remembering every single thing about the picture. All right, so that's just experiment one. Let's look at experiment two. The next uh, experiment's pretty straightforward, and the important thing about it is that it is uh, replication. So the author takes basically the same experiment, gives it to a different group of people, and asks the question, do I find basically the same results? So this time, 116 school children aged 16 to 18 took the questionnaire and then they did the memory test. He did the same thing, took the eight lowest scorers, those are the people who have who said they had the, the best visual imagery, and then the eight of the highest scores, they got um, closest to five, so they were considered the poorest visualizers and gave both of those groups of people the picture memory test that we just learned about. So what happened? If we take a look at the results for experiment two, focus on this last column here, the good visualizers got 3.57 correct out of five, and the poor visualizers got 3.05 out of five. Similar pattern results, the numbers aren't exactly the same, Again, we're seeing the good visualizers doing a little bit better than the poor visualizers, but about a half a question better. Let's jump down to the third experiment. Now, in this experiment, what happened was the author made a few changes to the multiple choice questions that were used to ask people about the details of those pictures. What they'd found in an analysis of the results from experiment one and two was that only about half of the questions, those multiple choice questions, actually discriminated between subjects. If you looked at the other half of the questions, uh, everybody either got them all correct or everybody got them all wrong. So they wanted to replace those questions that everyone got right or wrong with questions that were more mixed results. And this would be uh, better for potentially discriminating between people, um, how people's mental imagery abilities will influence their memory for pictures. So experiment three was the same as experiment one. 75 intro psych students did this experiment. The 18 lowest and 18 highest scores were split into the good and poor groups. And then they did the memory test for the pictures with the new questions. Here's the table of results right here. Looking at the last column, we get 3.3 uh, out of 5 for the good visualizers and 2.8 out of 5 for the poor visualizers. Again, that's a spread of what? 0.45, close to half a question, and fairly consistent across the three experiments. So that's that's pretty much this paper. The conclusions and discussion are all right here in this one little section at the end. I'm going to draw your attention to two statements 
uh, that are made here. The first one is, in all three of the experiments described, verbal reports of visual image of vividness were found to be reliable predictors of accuracy in the recall of information contained in pictures. Finally, on the assumption that vividness ratings and recall are both mediated by the same covert event of visual image, these results can be interpreted as providing further evidence that images, your mental imagery, has an important function in memory. All right, we're going to take the last couple minutes here and consider some things that aren't in the paper because uh, these are skills we'll be developing over the rest of the course. So to recap what I just said, this paper shows some evidence that mental imagery, how vivid your mental imagery is, might be causally related to your ability to remember details from pictures. We can think of this as a claim and also as a claim that is somewhat substantiated with evidence. Those three experiments that we went over, they showed three situations where people who gave, um, who are good visualizers had slightly better memory performance for pictures than people who said they were poor visualizers. So this opens up a whole bunch of questions. None of them we will solve today, but I just wanted to start talking about some of the questions uh, to have us consider them. So one kind of question is, how exactly does the process of mental imagery help the process of remembering details of pictures? In other words, if this causal connection is actually true and mental imagery does do these things, we've got a bunch of questions on how does it do those things? An entirely different set of uh, questions has to do with alternative explanations. It seems plausible that my ability to uh, mentally image something and inspect the details of that mental image might be related to my ability to inspect a real image and remember details from that. At the same time, it's not necessarily the case that these three experiments that we just looked at uh, provide evidence that is totally connected to these issues. We might be able to come up with alternative explanations uh, regarding the findings. And so the author doesn't talk about this so much in the paper. It's something that we should have in the back of our minds. For example, here is a, a kind of limitation you could come up with if you're thinking about this study. You might say, oh, okay, it is true that across these three experiments, the good visualizers showed better memory for pictures than the poor visualizers, but the difference was really small, probably wouldn't be meaningful in the real world, and probably wouldn't generalize beyond the specific individuals that were tested in these experiments. Maybe it's just something funny to do with those participants. I could imagine the author coming back with a response to that kind of criticism. For example, the author took extra steps to test his procedure across three different groups of people. These, these were fairly large groups of people. And you might expect to find very similar results to what he found in 1973 if you were to do these same procedures on another group of people. So you could uh, try replicating these things even more to address the concern about whether the results are generalizable or not. In the third experiment of this paper, the researcher brings up a concern that could very well um, cause a reinterpretation of the results. And they noted that some of the questions that were asked, the multiple choice questions about the details of the pictures, they seem to matter a lot. Half of the questions weren't very good questions for discriminating between the groups of people. 
So a concern that could be raised here is the findings may be very much driven by the specific pictures that were presented to subjects, as well as the specific questions that were given to subjects to measure their memory for the details in the pictures. These issues could be addressed also by running additional studies varying the kinds of pictures that were shown to people, as well as the kinds of tests used to assess memory for detail of the pictures. If we continue to find across all of these variations that people with who say they have good mental imagery perform at uh, higher levels than people who say they have poor visual imagery, um, at the end of the day, we might be more willing to accept the, the claims, the claims about that particular kind of evidence. And I'll just give one more alternative kind of concern or alternative explanation. You might wonder whether or not people who perform good or poorly uh, on the visual imagery questionnaire, if that performance is related to their actual mental imagery, or if it's more related to their understanding of the questionnaire. It's possible that the good visualizers are people who are eager and trying to give uh, better answers for this questionnaire and the people who are poor visualizers, maybe they're just not paying attention and they don't really understand the purpose of the questionnaire or the purpose of the task. And so they're not giving the answers closer to one, they're giving answers closer to five, which reflect not totally understanding what's going on. I mean, these are these are kind of things that I'm bringing up off the top of my head uh, to consider alternative types of explanations. And we'll be doing much more of that for many other papers throughout the semester. All right, that's it for me today. I'll see